All right, we are beginning a new series on the Holy Spirit, and uh, today, by the way, is Pentecost Sunday, and so what I've asked our ushers to do is to bring some boxes up here. We have a bunch of snakes, and we're going to ask and see how Pentecost, no, I'm just kidding. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. Today is Pentecost Sunday, and we're going to explain to you what Pentecost means, by the way. Pentecost is the birth of the church. It happened about 2,000 years ago. And we are affiliated with a, a group, an organization called the Assemblies of God, which is Pentecostal. And you're like, uh-oh, I, I, I thought I liked this church, Pentecostal. And I don't even like the word anymore because the word has lost its meaning to mean something completely different. Uh, it, you know, it just has lost its meaning. I mean, I'll give you an example. Uh, I'm just helping you understand this. I, I'm a full believer in the experience of the Holy Spirit and how we can have a relationship with them. But I, I've seen a lot of stuff through the years, and one of my good friends, or one of my friends actually, is becoming a better friend, from Texas, he's a pastor, assistant pastor at a large, large church, and he was asking his next door neighbor to come to church with him. He said, you got to come to my church, you got to come to my church. And they were really exuberant, they had the tambourines, they had the flags, it was awesome, great worship, and all that. So he brings his friend, after six months of asking him to come, finally, the guy decides to come. Have you ever done that? You invite someone to church, the church is always normal, but the one day you invite them, I say something really stupid, <laughs> or, or something embarrassing happens. Well, he has got this guy in the front row, right? And I'm not, this is a true story. I wish I was making it up, but the person would sit there, and, you know, sit, and it's good to do that, so that's fun, you know, you do the flags, whatever. They were doing the flags, and they go, whoosh, whoosh. well, what happens, this guy's sitting there, and all of a sudden, a person flips the flag, and goes, whoosh. And his person starts bleeding in church. And he said, and he talked to his pastor. He said, Pastor, we can't be having this going on here. I mean, uh, it's just freedom of the Holy Spirit. Listen, the Holy Spirit doesn't damage people, okay? And, and, and you know, it doesn't like give you a towel whip. Uh, you know, and, and maybe, in, and I, I'm sure Esteban can equate to this. Also, people often think Pentecostal means tambourines. And if you're on a worship team, and you have someone that can't play the tambourine, you're trying to go one, two, three, and you're like, ah, you know, it's like, and so what's going on? Or maybe you grew up in a church where Pentecostal meant you can't wear any makeup at all. I don't wear any makeup, okay, though I could use it for the shine. But anyhow, uh, and you wear no makeup at all, and you wear these like really morbid clothes, and you put your hair in a bun, a Pentecostal bun. Now, apparently, it's cool for guys to have buns. A little, I, I, try to put, I try to grow one, but I can't. But a Pentecostal bun, you know, they're real, real tight. You know what I'm talking about? They grow their hair down to their ankles. And you know what they call that, by the way? They call that bondage. But anyhow, um, so maybe you grew up with that. You can't do anything. You can't swim. You can't, if you go swimming with another person, it's called mixed bathing. So that means Pentecostal. It means I can't do anything. I got to wear no makeup at all. Oh, then the other church, it's all about the makeup. And you're like, whoa, you know, and it's like everything's excessive. And you're like, what's the story with this? What's the deal? Then you hear these crazy stories and, you know, and, um, and, and I don't know about you, but I've seen some great stuff. And it's really unfortunate that you can go to a restaurant and have the greatest food in the world, but one bad meal and the word gets out there, right? And so many times there's people out there that just do kind of weird and kooky things. Ben Kinslow, one of my favorite people growing up listening to, and uh, used to be in the 700 Club, and this is what he said. Uh, he said it, I didn't say it. He said, if it, um, he says, a lot of people are like fruitcakes. He says, if, if they're fruitcakes before they come to Christian, if, if they're not Christian, they're not Christian but they're fruitcakes. When they become Christians, they become Christian fruitcakes. So <laughs> and what he meant by that is people are weird, and sometimes I'm weird. Yeah, that's why you like me so much, right? So sometimes we're all weird. We do weird things, and sometimes things happen we don't like. And, uh, and so many people attribute that to the Holy Spirit. And it's, it's not by accident, by the way. I think the enemy tries to do that to bring division. And then what happens is the Pentecostals feel like they don't appreciate us, and we start, we start making our little case, and we, we speak in tongues in our church. Well, we don't, that's from the devil. And then you hear about this, and then you're like, well, who's right? Who's wrong? The Holy Spirit does not need it anymore today. We have, this, we have the canon of Scripture. The apostles are no longer here. Um, that, that went out with the apostles, and speaking of tongues is of the devil. I mean, I heard people say that. If you don't speak in tongues, you're going to hell. If you don't speak in tongues, you're a second-class Christian, and you're like, all this tongue stuff, you know what? 
I don't want to deal with that. And, you know, and you've been to churches, and it happened to me too. Repeat after me. Should have bought a Honda. Should have bought a Honda. Should have bought a Honda. And I, I didn't repeat after them. And, and I felt like I was being pressured to say something I didn't even feel like I was supposed to say. I, I'm just telling you how I grew up. Not with my family, but going through the times. And, and by the way, I've also had amazing experiences with the Holy Spirit in all kinds of churches. So, but I want to encourage you today. I'm going to ask you to do something, please, in this series. Would you please just let go of all the preconceived notions of what Pentecostal means? Or, by the way, we're going to describe what it means in a, few, in a little bit. Can you let go of all that? And can we just go to the Bible and look at what it has to say? The enemy does it. You know why? The enemy does everything he can to, to take the power out of the church by making us scared of it. Do you realize, I was reading uh, some stuff from Yale Divinity, which is a really um, liberal, don't even believe in that Jesus is God, uh, a divinity school, reading their publications, I get it in the mail, I read other stuff out there, I read some stuff, I read some new age stuff. I just want to keep on track what's going on, you know, and also I do my meditations and I'm just kidding. I don't do that, okay? But I remember reading stuff that's saying, I read an article saying, oh, yes, the, the Holy Spirit, you know, it's in all religions, and what it is, it's getting the Spirit of God. So what they've done, they've taken a, uh, taken a bona fide uh, title, and they've attributed it to spiritualism. Oh, yes, the Holy Spirit. So now if you're reading New Age stuff, which I encourage you not to read, they're talking about the Holy Spirit. You've got to get in touch with it and all that kind of stuff. And so the Holy Spirit becomes like this energy force, and it almost becomes like the, you know, George Lucas type of theology, where it's just about a force of nature. You've got to feel the force, Luke, you know, uh, and all that kind of thing. But what is, what is the Holy Spirit? Well, how would you like if I say, what is Sandra? I wouldn't do that. Say, my wife is this. And by the way, did she not do an amazing job last week? Thank you, honey. So I almost told her, you got it again this week. I enjoyed it so much, I want you to preach again this week. But it was just a blessing to have her share. And just as you had a chance to hear about Sandra last week, I really want to introduce to you someone that's not strange and weird, but someone who is a person. It's called the Holy Spirit. A person I speak to every single day. A person I literally have a conversation with. Well, yeah, well, you'll see by the end of the series, you're going to be swinging from the chandeliers and laying hands on the sick and they will work. Okay. Listen, I want to let you know that everything that God has for us is good. People make weird things. Weird things happen no matter what happens. Do people abuse money? Oh, yeah, right? People abuse money. And so many people say, well, I've seen so much abuse with the Holy Spirit. I want nothing to do with it. Well, if that was the case. People abuse money. So I guess what we should do with that same rationale, let's just get rid of money because people abuse it. Of course people abuse it. But listen, the Holy Spirit is a person who wants to have a relationship with you and help you. And I want to encourage you with that. And, and, and in fact, the Holy Spirit's been misunderstood throughout the history of the church. In fact, if you look at Acts chapter 19, verse 1. By the way, if you want to bring your Bibles, please bring your Bibles or bring your devices with you. And uh, what I really want to encourage you to do, because, you know, when I grew up, I used to have my one Bible. I used to uh, underline it, and then I used to spill a little bit of coffee. And then I could remember 10 years later, oh, yeah, by the coffee stain on the left-hand side of the corner, that's where it talks about the Holy Spirit. I could find it. Now today we have all these things, and we don't, you know, what I do is I download a special app in which I can write notes with. It goes to the iCloud, and then I can take notes and, and write in church and whatever. And I would encourage you to, to write whatever you need to do. Get into the Word of God. It's important. All right? So anyhow, Acts chapter 19, verse 1. And it happened when Apollos was at Corinth. And this is about... 10, 15 years after Jesus died, rose again from the dead, and Pentecost happened, the church is moving forward, okay? And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, we have not much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. There's a lot of people in the, day in the church. Look what it says here. Finding some disciples means they're a followers of Christ. They believe Christ. They give their life to Christ. But they were ignorant about the Holy Spirit. And the apostle Paul asked them, hey, listen, have you heard about the Holy Spirit? We haven't even heard. There is something such as the Holy Spirit. And many people in the church today do not know about the Holy Spirit. 
So today all I can do is introduce him to you through the eyes of Jesus, in the eyes of creation. Let me tell you the reason why. The reason why is Jesus says, as the Father sends me, so I send you. So basically, let me help you understand to remind you the ministry of Jesus is going to help us to understand the Holy Spirit in us today. And then we're going to go into different weeks. We're going to talk about it, and we're going to bring more clarity. And I believe when we're all done, we're going to be raising the dead. Why not? What? Okay. After this, we're going to the, the, uh, uh, the mortuary. We're going to go and practice, okay? So you make sure. That wasn't funny. Okay. I'll hear about it at lunch. Okay. Um, and it happened, as Apollos was in Corinth, that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus, and finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? As they said, we have not so much even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. So what is, or better yet, not what is, who is the Holy Spirit? And how did Jesus encounter the Holy Spirit? Well, it's very interesting. You can see the Holy Spirit from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. In fact, in um, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it starts with the Holy Spirit. Do you believe that? Look what it says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the, the waters. And so you can see even in creation. And, and by the way, let me also tell you that it was also in the word Jesus. Do you realize that Jesus was also, the Holy Spirit was part of Jesus? Now, let's just stop here for a moment and pause, and I just wanted to reiterate to you and to re-familiarize ourselves what the purpose of Jesus is, why he came to the earth. Jesus came as what? A sacrificial lamb to take away the sins of the world, right? That was his major objective. That's what it was. Why? Because mankind fell. The first Adam blew it, and so there had to be a sacrifice for sins, and because God so loved the world, he sent Jesus as, what, the sacrificial lamb. So Jesus was fully God and fully human, which, which really bothers people. It's hard to grasp, but he was fully God and fully human. And so what happened was Jesus had a two-pronged purpose to come to the planet. The first purpose was to save mankind from its sins. The second was to inaugurate the kingdom of God. Many of the church today are fine with believing Jesus for the sacrificial lamb. But they have a hard time accepting that he baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. That part they don't want to talk about. Well, let me show you what I'm talking about here. How this all began. In Luke chapter 1, do you realize that Jesus, when he was born, look what it has to say here. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be? When the angel came to her and said, you're going to have Jesus. Since I do not know a man, and the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One which is born shall be called the Son of God. So basically, the Holy Spirit was going to impregnate Mary. The seed would be through the Holy Spirit. And so do you realize that Jesus was a result of the Holy Spirit? From the very inception of his earthly ministry, it was by the Holy Spirit. In Matthew 1.8, it says this. Now the birth of Jesus was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Do you see that? That Jesus came into being by the Holy Spirit. Now, for 30 years, Jesus lived a sinless life. We don't hear much about him. We hear about when he's 12 years old. We hear about when he's about three. And we hear about when he's about one. But we don't hear about his ministry after that. And so he's living with his parents and all that. He, that he was just like us, by the way. Let me explain. Jesus left, according to Philippians 2, he left all his godly authority. He left all of his, his power and his wonder and his splendor. And he decided to become one of us because he loved us so much. There had to be a payment. He became just like you and I. So everything Jesus did, he limited the scope of his power to human power only. And so he was just like you and I, except one Two major differences. Number one, he was still God. And number two, he was sinless. 
I have news for you today. It might be a shock to some of you. You're not God, and you're not sinless. Only Jesus is God, and only him is sinless. But he limited the scope of who he was to be a human being. Now, this is amazing. Because he was a human being, he's called the second Adam. If Jesus was born, lived a sinless life, and let's say he gave the new teachings and all that, and they said, you know, we don't like this guy, we're going to put him on the cross. If he died on the cross, and that's all he did, that would be enough for you and I to have salvation and to come in contact with God. Isn't that good news, everybody? Right? And, uh, but by, by a majority of the evangelical Bible-believing church, they're all fine with that. So many people will take the first purpose of Jesus was what? To save us from our sins, to be the sacrificial lamb, right? That was the main purpose of Christ. But there was a second purpose of Christ we miss, and that was to inaugurate the kingdom of heaven. I'll just show you what I'm talking about. If you want to look, please, at Luke chapter 3, verse 21. Much of the church today is fine with Jesus as our Savior. We'll talk about Jesus dying on the cross. We'll share the gospel message. There's power in it, which I'll show you in a few moments, but we don't talk about the second part of it, which I'm going to show you. Luke chapter 3, verse 21. Jesus is 30 years old. He goes to the River Jordan to be baptized, and by his cousin, John, by the way, and John's like, wait a minute, I don't want, you should be baptizing me, not, you, not the other way around. And John says, that he's gonna be, one day this, uh, this gentleman's going to come, he's going to baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit. And so John was like, I don't want it to be done. But look what he has to say here. Look what happened. Luke 3, verse 21. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heavens were open. And the Greek and the, and, and the grammar and all that, it basically means the heavens kind of broke open, and it was like another realm came. The heavens broke open, right? And it came to pass that while he prayed, the heaven was open, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove, not a dove. The Holy Spirit is not a bird, okay? It's not a dove. He came like a dove, which means he came very gently and beautifully and quietly. All right, that's what it means. The Holy Spirit is not a bird. All right? Aren't you glad? I am. Okay. When people think, well, the Holy Spirit's a bird. No, he's not a bird. Okay? He came like a bird. So, which we'll talk about in coming weeks. And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven and said, You are my beloved son, who I am well pleased. Now, we have a greater description about this found in John, where he talks about the significance of this event. Verse 32 of John chapter 1. And John bore witness saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. Let me stop there for a moment. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon different people for a task or something, and then it would go. But this was different. The Holy Spirit came upon Jesus, and it stayed with him. Let's continue to read. He says, I did not know him, but he sent me to be baptized with water. Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, he's the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So John says, I baptize with water, but he who's coming after me will baptize you with the fire and the Holy Spirit. Now, who baptizes people in the Holy Spirit? It's Jesus. Okay? So what happened was this. Jesus' earthly ministry was going fine. He could have died on the cross before Jordan River. But at the Jordan River, something happened to Jesus. What happened was, he was limited in the power or scope of who he was, like you and I, but the Holy Spirit came upon him. And from that point forward, he was led by the Father and empowered by the work and the person of the Holy Spirit. And it says immediately in Luke chapter 4, 1, then Jesus being filled with the Spirit was led into the wilderness. Then we start seeing miracles take place. Water into wine, blind eyes opened, dead being raised, uh, preaching and talking. He would talk and the whole atmosphere would change. He would do great stuff. And people are like, wow, this guy Jesus, wow, he's amazing. All we need is to have Jesus around. When Jesus is around, everything's great. But you know what he kept doing? He kept giving his ministry away to other people. And that's the purpose of Cornerstone, by the way, is to give ministry away to other people, not to hoard it. 
I, I, I'm the pastor. You, you can't touch what I'm doing here. No, no, I'm over. No, it's about empowering people and letting them do it. That's the, always the ministry of Jesus, to empower people. That's the reason why we're here partially, is to empower you to be Christ on earth. And so what happened? Jesus began to do amazing stuff. And he would lay his hands on his apostles for a period of time, give them power, and they go out and do miracles. And this is all began to happen. So what basically happened is this. What was the purpose of Jesus' ministry? You're going to see it right here in Luke chapter 4. The first purpose was what? was the salvation, right? The lamb. The second purpose was to inaugurate the kingdom of heaven, a new way of living in God. So here it is. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. And the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed... This is Jesus talking. He, he's reading Isaiah. Because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor, preach to the poor, he has set me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to recover sight to the blind, which he literally did, to set liberty those who are oppressed. That's why we're all about getting people free in Christ. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's the kingdom of heaven. And he went around declaring the kingdom of heaven. Demons were cast out. People were bound up with sin and guilt and shame. And a prostitute now returned to as one of his greatest followers. A cheating tax collector became a great person. Why? Because Jesus came that they'd, find, they'd know God and they'd find freedom through Christ. And that happened through the power of the Holy Spirit. So everything Jesus did, he did by the power and the work of the Holy Spirit. He was just like you and I, except he was God and he was perfect. But the capacity of his strength was based upon his relationship with the Father and the inworking of the Holy Spirit. I hope, you, I hope you're tracking with me, okay? All right, great. Now, Jesus serves as a prototype of what you and I are called to be. We'll never, be, we'll never be God, but we're supposed to be like God, okay? But we're supposed to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, how's that supposed to happen? Jesus said some wild, wild things. He said this, it's to your advantage that I go away. Now, I think most of us would say, what this world we need now is Jesus to be here right now. And I would agree with you 100%. But if Jesus was going to come back like he did 2,000 years ago prior to lit, um, raising from the dead, it would be counterproductive. What? Yeah. That means that Jesus would be in one place. He'd be in Jerusalem. You would have to get on a plane, and you'd have to fly to Jerusalem. You'd have to wait in this huge line and hope to get a glimpse of him. Maybe you can kiss his ring or something, right? And he'd be this one person, and he, one person at one place. He'd be ineffective. So Jesus says, it's to your advantage that I go, that he may come. Why? Because the same spirit that rose me from the dead, the same spirit that gives me the power of uh, the person can be given to you so you can do the stuff I'm doing. You'll see what I'm talking about in a few seconds. He says the following, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. If I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, but if I depart, I will send him to you. John 20, 20. When he said this, he showed his hands. This is after he rose again from the dead. The disciples were glad when they saw him. And so Jesus said to him, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, so I what? Send you. Okay, as the Father sent me, now I send you. Now you're going to be little Jesuses going around. Okay, that's what you're going to be. And so, okay, you're going to come to know me, give your life to me, you'll get saved. But you also need to be filled with the Holy Spirit to do the stuff that I did. That's what Jesus says. Peace be to you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he said this to them, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, what's really weird is, okay, then they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. No, they were not baptized in the Holy Spirit. They received the Spirit. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, you receive God's Spirit in you. You become born again. Jesus received the Spirit of God when he became a human being. When you give your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit's already in you. You're saved. There's nothing you can do about it. You give your life to Christ, you're saved. Okay? You, you, hope, you follow me, okay? That in itself is so important. It's the most important thing. But Jesus didn't just come to save us. 
He came to make a difference on the planet, to heal the brokenhearted, to bring healing to the captives, right? And how did he do that? By the work of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus told his disciples, you're filled the whole, you know, you receive the Spirit, they, came, they became saved. Now, the Holy, now Jesus was inside of them in their hearts because he was going away. Do you follow me? Okay, now watch this. And he says to them, he says, he breathes on them, and then in Luke 24, 47, it says this. And the repentance and the remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. He's talking about what has to happen to his disciples. He's about ready to go. And you are to be my witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But before I, before I go any further, I want to bring up the word witness because it also says, you shall be my witnesses. Okay, it says in the Great Commission, it says it here. You know what it means to be a witness? Can I get a witness? Amen. Okay, that means you come and agree with me, right? That's what it means. Or if you see something, you see an accident, you say, I witness, I saw the, the cat, uh, excuse me, I saw the, um, the deer get run, I'm not going to mention any about cats. Uh, I saw the dog get run over by the cat, Okay. So I saw it happen. I saw, I, I witnesses took place. I, I'm in a court of law, I witness. It means you testify to something. Do you know in the Greek, when it uses this word witness, it doesn't mean that? This is what it means. If I show my son or my daughter to throw a baseball, okay, I'm going to witness this, witness this, watch it. And I throw the baseball, and then I show her how to do it, how to go back, how to throw it, and I show how to do that. Okay, now what's happened is I've witnessed to her how to throw a baseball. Now, in our English word, it'd be like, oh yeah, I witnessed my dad throw, and so you can throw a baseball. No, in the Greek it would mean she picks up the baseball and she throws it just like I did. Now she's witnessing what I showed her. So what Jesus is saying, do the stuff that I'm doing. Now watch this. Watch this. On verse 48, second half. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And so he basically said, I want you to wait. I don't want you. He breathed on them to receive the Holy Spirit. He said, I don't want you going out and doing the stuff until you are like me in the River Jordan. In the River Jordan, the Spirit of God came upon me, and, and, and I came empowered in the Holy Spirit, and I went out in the power of the Spirit. Don't go out until you're filled with the power of the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. You're my prototypes. You're to be me up on the earth. It's to your advantage that I go away, that he may come. Instead of me being in one place at one time, I can spread you guys all around. Now look what he has to say in John 14, 12. I tell you the truth. Anyone, who, man, women, and children, anyone who believes in me will do the what? The same works that I have done and even greater works. Well, that's because we, there's many more of us today. We're doing more. No. Do you realize in the book of Acts there's some miracles that took place that never took place in the life of Jesus? We never saw uh, Jesus' shadow healing anybody, but Peter's shadow healed people. You know, I've, I, there's today I hear stories all the time from missionaries that I love and trust, and we've seen God do miracles right here. If I were to ask you, how many of you have been touched and healed by a divine miracle but in your body? Let's see a quick look around. I mean, there's people all around here that have been healed. Okay? God has healed cancer. He's opened up deaf ears. He's done all kinds of great stuff. He does it today. He does it especially in places that don't hear about the gospel. So what it basically says, anyone who believes me will do the same works that I have done and even greater works. Why? Because I go to the Father and I will send him. But don't leave home without it. Not American Express, but the Holy Spirit. And John 14 says, if you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father. He will give you another advocate. He will never leave you. You see, the Holy Spirit, I, I, I hope you're tracking with me here. The two purposes of Christ. The first purpose was to save us from our sins. The second was to inaugurate the kingdom of heaven. He says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. You give your life to Christ, you're saved. But now he's asking you to be filled with the Holy Spirit like he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was filled with the Holy Spirit at the River Jordan. The Holy Spirit came upon him, remained upon him, and empowered him. And my friends, you and I need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. So what does all this mean? I'm going to bring it down a little bit here. What is Pentecost all about? What's the, what's the deal with Pentecost? Okay, this is, a, this is really wild, okay? So bear with me here. Do you know what pent means? 
five. You know what kosti means in the Greek? To the tenth power. Okay, this is really going to freak you out. You know what Pentecost means? Fifty. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> Fifty. I know, I'm two years from it. I get a little nervous about it. But anyhow, 50. Pentecost. It means 50. That's it. But you know, I, I want to share with you, uh, there's about three festivals, major festivals in the Jewish faith. And they all, by the way, point to Christ. The first one's called the Passover. You know what the Passover is, right? Passover lamb, right? The, Jesus is the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. The, the, during the Passover, they had the blood of the lamb. They put it in the doorpost. A deaf angel came. And then when the angel came, if you had the blood, you were saved. So that was called the Passover. And so what happened to the Passover? Very interesting. Do you realize that they would sacrifice the lamb at 9 a.m. during the Passover? At 3 p.m., they'd put it in the oven for the remissions of those sins. Do you realize that Jesus was hung on the cross at 9 in the morning? He died at 3 p.m., and he takes away our sins. It's not by accident that God does these things. Do you know what Pentecost was? Pentecost was celebrated 50 days after the Passover. Jesus was on the earth for 40 days, showing himself to different people. Over 500 people saw him. After 40 days, he ascended to heaven. And then he told his disciples, wait until you are clothed with power from and hide. Ten days came later. It was 40 days when he was here. The ten days they waited, they came to the dirty word, Pentecost. Fifty. The, fellowship, the, the, the festival of Pentecost. Do you know what Pentecost was, by the way? Pentecost, in the Old Testament, was the, uh, was the celebration and remembrance of what took place at Mount Sinai. For those of you who watched C.C. DeMille's The Great Ten Commandments, not the new one, the new one's terrible. And what happened was, at Mount Sinai, what happened? God says, consecrate yourself. I'm going to reveal myself to you. And another sermon for another time, great message. We can learn about the whole Israel had an opportunity to become priest. But they said, no, Moses, you go for us. But what happened at Pentecost was this. The fire came on top of the mountain. Moses went up to the mountain for 40 days. God wrote on the rock the law, right? He came down after 40 days. He heard them all like the golden calf happened. What happened? 3,000 people ended up dying, but they had the law, and the nation was really formed. It became a real nation at that point. You know what happened on the day of Pentecost? I'll tell you what happened. Fire fell from heaven like tongues in each person. That's what happened. Also what happened is God wrote the law on the hearts of men and women. And 3,000 people came to know Christ that day. It's not an accident, my friends. That was the birth of the church. Pentecost was the birth of the nation of Israel as a bona fide nation. And as a bona fide and deputized and empowered church was Pentecost. Not by accident this happened. So that's what Pentecost means. It is a festival. Then you have the Feast of Tabernacles, which we'll share at another time, which talks about the coming of Christ later on. So that's what all it means, friends. And so now, when you read Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, that's what it says. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly, there came the sound from heaven. And by the way, so many times when you are praying, or like, God, 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 you're praying, you're praying, and then suddenly God showed up on the day of Pentecost, 50 days from the Passover. And then there appeared in them divided tongues of fire, and they sat on front of each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. We're going to more detail later. They began to speak in tongues. Now I knew he was going to talk about that. I thought I liked Cornerstone. Oh, here we go, the tongue thing. They're going to slap me on the head until I repeat some babbling phrase. No, we're not going to do that. I promise you we're not do that. We don't have to do that. We don't need gimmicks. The Spirit of God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We're going to talk about tongues at another time. We can't do it all today. Unless if you want to just cancel all your appointments, we can stay here all day. I'm, I'm okay with that. Okay, and you're like, you guys are very quiet. You should say, yeah, sure. No, that's not going to happen. 
So what happened was the inauguration of the church began. You see it? One more. I'm going to just review once again. We're going to close out with some attributes. Jesus came for two reasons. Number one, to be the sacrificial lamb. Number two, to inaugurate the kingdom of heaven. Okay? When you and I give our life to Christ, we give our life to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes upon us, comes in us. But God wants to baptize us like he baptized Jesus at the Jordan River. So why? So we could do greater works than we could do. Listen, there's so many times that I'm like, God, what am I supposed to do? The more I rely on the Holy Spirit, the more we're going to talk about how to cultivate it and invite the Holy Spirit. And, you know, we're going to talk about it. It's really some great stuff. I'm really encouraged. I believe Cornerstone is going to go to a whole new level because we're going to embrace the Holy Spirit for who he is and not all the culture nonsense that we've let get muddy the waters. It's real simple. Keep to the scriptures. Do what he says. I guarantee you, you're going to see more miracles take place in your life. You're going to see your marriages get better. You're going to see people get healed more. Why? Because we're going to invite the Holy Spirit. Let me say a couple of things about who he is. First of all, he is a him. He's a person. It says, the, listen to this, John 14, 17. The spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and is in you. It's a him. It is a person. It is not an it. It's not cousin it from that little, remember cousin it? I'm dating myself. Da -da -da -da. Da -da -da -da. Cousin it, you didn't know what it was, right? He's a him. He's not weird, okay? He's God. Well, I don't, I don't like the Holy Spirit stuff. Then you're saying, I don't like God. I don't like that God stuff. He's God. He's part of God. How do I know that? Look what it says in uh, Acts 5, 3 through 4. And Peter said to him, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart? To lie to the Holy Spirit. Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? Why have you, you have not lied to men, but you've lied to God? So you see that right there. He's also called the comforter. I don't know about you, but I like comfort. Don't you like comfort? He's called a paraclete, one that comes alongside. I, I like comforters, by the way. I don't, I, I, and when we first got married, we went to the bed, bath, and whatever. Uh, we bought, I don't know if it was bed, bath, or Sears, not Sears, uh, Macy's. We bought this huge comforter, like this big monster thing. It's like, look like you could jump off a building and, and be fine if you land in it. And it's this nice big comforter, right? But we didn't want to use it. I'm actually getting all excited after the honeymoon. I can't wait to go eat the comforter. I'm so excited. We had this old hand-me-down that we, you know, my like the third generation little blanket's about this thin. But like, honey, can we use our comforter? No, 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 no. We don't use that. We take it off the bed. What do we have it for? I don't want to, I want to use the comforter. Have you noticed that? I grew up and my mom has these towels in the bathroom. <laughs> and I, I get out of the shower and I use it. What did you do? What? You used the towels. Well, what are they there for? They're for guests. <laughs> I come home from school. I see an Enderman's cake, coffee cake. I go, I cut myself a big piece and get a cup of, uh, a cup of uh, milk. What are you doing? Don't touch that. What? That's for guests. What am I supposed to eat? Eat the stale bread over there. I mean, so, so many times we say we like comforter, but we ignore him. We talk about the Holy Spirit. We sing about the Holy Spirit. Oh, I remember 1968 when I spoke in tongues for the first time. Hallelujah. Uh, what have you done since? I spoke in tongues. But what have you done? I'm Pentecostal. What have you done? It's not about speaking in tongues. It's not about dancing. It's not about laying hands. It's not about, no. It, it, all those things are fine. But it's about being empowered to live the life that God has called you to live and to do things beyond the scope of your uh, uh, natural capacity to live a supernatural life. When I read the headlines, my God, do we need supernatural living in these days. So many of us have been hoping to know the political process and hoping to forget about that. You need to focus on being supernaturally empowered by God to live in these days. And so, what I want to encourage you with this. Jesus says this. He wants us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Thank you, worship team. Make your way. That's what God wants to do. So he's not weird. You're not going to become a, a raving, strange person. 
Do I have to speak in? Listen, it's not all about, we'll get to all that stuff later. Don't get involved with all that other stuff. It's fine. It's not what makes the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is all about knowing God, having him filled, and then empowering you to be. But you have to ask for him. You ask. If you, God will give you what you ask. If you want it from him, he'll give you the Holy Spirit. The Bible promises that. You don't have to be good enough. You don't have, no. All you have to do is give your life to Jesus Christ and then ask him to fill you. We're getting to more of the details. There's so much more we're to say. We can't hit it all today, but I just wanted to lay down some simple, bedrock, foundational understanding that we're called to be like Jesus. Jesus came to bring us salvation, and he came to inaugurate a new way of living in power. Jesus could have died on the cross and never done one miracle and never been filled with the Holy Spirit and it would have been fine for us to have salvation. But he saw it necessary to be filled with the Holy Spirit so he could do his ministry. And Jesus says, do not leave without being filled with the Holy Spirit. If Jesus found it necessary, being perfect, how much more do you and I need the Holy Spirit? I don't know about you, but I don't want to be living in my own strength anymore. I want to be living beyond who I am. I, it's my desire to see this church be beyond a group of people in a room, but a living organism that is living with the person and the power of the Holy Spirit, where it Miracles begin to happen, not just so you can say, look at me. No, it's so people can come to know Jesus Christ and the world can be transformed. Listen, if God can transform a pagan Roman culture, he sure can take care of America. If we will become infilled with the Holy Spirit, watch what God will do in you and me and our church with our children and, yes, our society. Let's be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for Pentecost. Thank you that you show us these things in Scripture. Not so we can educate ourselves. You've done it so we can experience the power of you. So, Father, I thank you for that today. And Lord, I just pray for everyone listening here this morning, God, whether it's live right now or, or later on, I just pray, Father, that everyone would be quickened to come to know you right now, Lord God. In Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you a question. Do you know Jesus? I'm not asking if you know about him. I'm saying, do you know Jesus? I just talked to a gentleman yesterday. Lost his nephew, 27-year-old, got hit by a drunk driver, dead. Lost his nephew. You don't know when your time is. If you were to die, do you know exactly where you'd go? Well, I'm pretty good. It's not about being pretty good. There's only one way to be assured to know with God is through a relationship of Jesus Christ, asking Christ to take away the sins that you have. Receiving his forgiveness is the only way. If you've never done that, today can be the day. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads if you could. Be so kind. I'm going to pray a prayer. It's not a magical prayer. It's all about your heart engaging what your mouth says. So you want to pray after me in the quietness of your heart. Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. Today, I resign from being in control. I declare I'm giving my life to you. I'm not going to wait to get my act together because I never could get it together. I thank you that you take me like I am. I give you my life. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown, and I give you my life today. Cleanse me, purify me. I believe you are the Son of God, and I give my life today afresh in Jesus' name. With every head bowed, just so I know how to pray better for you, and, and it's good to be bold. And, and the count of three, we're going to ask you to raise your hand real quick, just so I can see. Say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer today. Go ahead, real quick. Just close your hand. Come on. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Come on. Let's be bold here. Let's just, thank you. Okay. Now I'm going to pray for the rest of us. I'm going to ask if we could all stand. Listen, we don't have to go through like five weeks of a series before you can get it. All you got to do is ask. You can be filled with the Holy Spirit today. We don't have to speak it. Don't worry about all that stuff, Okay. You ask, anyone who asks will be filled. It's that simple. It's like salvation. We'll deal with the other stuff a little bit later. I wish we could stay here all day, but we can't. 
So let me pray with you. We want to lift your hands if you want to as an act of surrender. I'm going to pray right over you right now. You want to repeat after me? Lord Jesus, I thank you that you are alive today and you promised that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. I ask you to fill me afresh with your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I welcome you. I ask you to infill me, to give me the power to do things I cannot do in my own. I pray you give me the power to understand the scriptures when I read them. I pray you give me the power that my prayers would become stronger and that I would walk in your ways. In Jesus' name, I thank you by asking. I am now filled with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you've asked it, you've received it. But what about tongues? What about prophecy? Okay, that, we can talk about that another time. You asked for it. Now we have to learn how to access what he's given to us. It's that simple. It's that simple. Let's be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's learn how to utilize what God has given us. All the signs and wonders are available for today. But it's not about us. Not about us parading them around. Not about us, I'm better. No, never about that. It's about exalting Jesus. The moment it becomes about us is the moment we got to say enough. All right, everybody? I'm going to ask the um, prayer team to make their way up. Um, if you need prayer for any reason at all, we'll have to pray with you. Otherwise, we're going to have a closing song. And if the band wants to play on, they can. But we're going to have the people here singing and praying for you. If you need prayer for anything at all, if you want prayer for the Holy Spirit, we'll pray with you, okay? encourage you, if you, if you prayed that prayer today to give Christ your life, if you could be so kind to fill that out, we want to be able to meet, if you want to bring it to one of the folks up here or put it in one of the boxes, we want to encourage you to grow in your life in Christ, okay? And if you need prayer for anything at all, we want to be able to pray with you, and I want to encourage you, let's go after God together. Let's be different than we are. Let's grow together. I've not arrived, neither have you. There's so much more of God that you and I have not experienced Let's lay aside our preconceived notions and let's jump into the promises of God with bold faith and see what God will do. And if you share, if you gave your life to Christ, say you need to share it with somebody. Okay? Listen, this is the most important thing you can do. We want to encourage you, okay? Uh, God bless you. Um, and the prayer team is still up here. If you'd like to come to our membership class called Connect, step two, we'd love to have you come to that. We got lunch ready for you. Otherwise, uh, we'll see you Friday night. God bless you.